Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure of being here today. I think the word intelligent has been said a couple of times today, but what is it? It's not really been defined, so I will be discussing a little bit of those aspects during my presentation. Um, so the fight as we know it today is mostly focused on testing and on the development of biological tools to um, um, analyze biological samples to detect substance. And this framework actually feeds the judicial process. It fulfills the needs for um, the work of the judicial process. The judicial process is uh, constituted of three different phases. The search, we will look for um, prohibited substances or methods in a biological sample. If we've got a suspicious case, or we will bring a um, second aspect, which is the investigation. We will gather the evidence, qualify the rule violation, and finally bring the case to court um, to present the evidence and to take a disciplinary measure. So this framework ensures that today we have state-of-the-art bioanalytical tools. We keep refining um, our methods. We keep developing new methods. Um, we also have reliable uh, results. Uh, and their quality is ensured by the ISO accreditation, uh, proficiency testings, et cetera, et cetera. Nevertheless, it's got some downsides. It absorbs uh, pretty much all of the resources of the labs for um, exploring exploratory research. And we are focusing our attention mostly on one eighth of the anti-doping rule violation, uh, which has been pointed out before, actually. So we are kind of missing out um, the bigger picture. We see the athlete and we focus our attention on the athletes, but we sometimes tend to forget that there are other entities gravitating around uh, the athlete. So what, what can we do? Uh, as a way of illustrating quickly um, this issue, I think it's been discussed today already, there is a gap between the prevalence and the statistics we've got on adverse analytical findings. So I won't go into details again, but the gap is quite significant. And how can we explain it? Well, we are facing many challenges. Um, scientific, organizational, operational, etc. Uh, we have to deal with continuously um, sophisticating doping practices. People are getting better and better, more and more professionalized. There are new doping agents, etc. There is also latency between the operation of um, substance on the market and its inclusion to the list, and subsequently um, until the development of a, a tool to uh, be able to analyze that, that substance. There is also the difficulty of targeting out of competition testing. It's also been pointing out today. Uh, there is a still a certain kind of randomness in out of competition testing. It's hard to find the relevant athletes at the relevant time of the year, the day, etc. So we need to find ways to fine tune actually our targeting. And of course, as in everything, we've got limitations um, for, like I said, exploratory research to think outside of that box. Nevertheless, there is hope in, uh, I think, in the third revision of the code that just got accepted. Um, they put more emphasis on investigations and on everything that, like I said, that gravitates around the fleet. So I think it will give for a more flexible and comprehensive fight in the future. Also, doping uh, shares a lot of similarities with criminality. And um, criminality has been addressed quite efficiently these last 10 to 15 years through the use of forensic intelligence, and that's what I will be discussing a little bit more. So what's forensic intelligence? Um, the definition is the gathering of knowledge that once logically processed can produce timely and usable, accurate, timely and usable information to support real-time decision making. The idea is to solve, reduce, or even sometimes prevent any given, given criminal phenomenon. So how does it work? We've got a criminal problem on which we will retrieve information, maybe coming from traces at, um, uh, at the place where the crime activity took place. Once that information is acquired, we will describe it, we will sort it out, and we will merge it with information that we already uh, have stored on that phenomenon, and um, it's stored in a memory. So we'll take our new information, merge it with the previous information to um, draw links to hypothesize links also to kind of try and understand how what are the mechanisms of that criminal activity and if we go through that memory then we will be able to produce that information information sorry that will transform into intelligence for impacting on our phenomenon if we get lucky or work well 
our problem will uh, be solved. Otherwise, it will adapt to our actions. So we will need to go through that process all over again. So it's a cyclical process. So like I said, it relies on the use of a structural memory. Um, it's a repertoire of systematically and continuously updated inference reasonings, which means hypotheses. And it has the ability to synthesize um, a set of information to describe the phenomenon, whether it is to get the general picture or to uh, understand better subparts of that phenomenon. Um, and the whole idea really is to have real-time knowledge, to not to be reactive, but to know what's going on uh, on that very day and even to sometimes foresee the development of um, the activities of criminal organizations or uh, serial crimes, etc., etc. There are actually three different levels of forensic intelligence. We got tactical, operational, and strategic intelligence. Uh, we move from a reactive case-based approach to a more proactive and problem-solving approach. At tactical level, which is Grown the well. Um, the idea is to focus on the individ individuals and to provide investigative leads to um, identify, localize, and arrest our suspects. And once this is done, we will gather the evidence and bring the case to court. Then, at a broader organizational level, we got operational intelligence. Then, we look into repetitive problems, such as the activities of criminal organizations or serial crimes. Um, then the information within this context will be used to analyze trends and to follow the phenomenon um, across space and time. And of course, we will try with this information to impact on the phenomenon through the coordination of actions that are terror, um, terror strategies for these problems. And eventually, strategic intelligence, which feeds on, on everything possible, is looking into crimi criminality as a whole, the whole phenomenon. And the idea is to uh, consider criminality as a part of the environment of society and understand what are the underlying mechanisms and um, what are the, the vulnerabilities of our system and how we can make up for these vulnerabilities to prevent the evolution of a phenomenon or even its operation. All these levels are not distinct processes. They interact and uh, they feed on common sources of information. So how can we apply it to anti-doping intelligence? Well, at tactical level, we will be focusing on the athletes, at operational level on organized doping or systematic doping also, and the trafficking of illicit uh, substances, and eventually at strategic level on the whole doping phenomenon. So just to illustrate these concepts, let's have a look at trafficking of prohibited substances. We have more than 200 pro prohibited substances on the list, which is really huge and it makes for a very attractive business. We have both legal substances, illegal substances, and everything in between. So you can go to your pharmacy and get um, over-the-counter pharmaceutical preparations containing some doping agents that are readily available. Or you may need a prescription for theoretical agents like, such as EPO or growth hormone. Or in any case, you have also illicit drugs like amphetamines, cocaine, etc and all the counterfeit medications, which is a huge problem altogether. So why, uh, while doping may be seen as set on the individual scale of the athlete, actually it's always pretty intimately linked to either doping networks or organized doping. And the major danger is that those activities are uh, sometimes and most often linked to criminal organizations. So if we look at the athlete again, in the way he is supplied in substances and in the way he is helped in the use of those substances, he's always linked to someone, either his friends or family, uh, team members, a medical staff, a physician, etc. And all those people, they supply themselves on the internet, as it has been pointed out before, or in the street, but less nowadays. And the internet is fed by clandestine laboratories and also the pharmaceutical industry, whether official or clandestine. But in the end, uh, the production and distribution is most often, um, and it has been demonstrated actually, belonging to the activities of criminal organizations. So the fleet is not really alone in the world, and uh, there is a lot that we can do to disrupt all those links. So how can we do this? Well, we can do strategic internet monitoring. 
which means we will look from, uh, for online sale websites through search engines, automatic gatherers, to list those websites, to follow them. We will extract the data. Uh, it will tell us what are the origins of the products, what are the sales areas, what's the geolocation of the retailer. Sometimes we even uh, get to know his identity. Uh, and also, which, uh, very informative source inf of information is forums, blogs, and social networks. As we have seen that going through them, you can detect new trends in the cost, either in the consumption or in the production of problems. And you can get also a general picture of the prevalence. So altogether, this strategic monitoring helps in understanding the market, how it's structured, and what are its dynamics, its evolution over time. A second tool um, that we just talked about, actually, is chemical and physical profiling of doping agents. If we do physical uh, examination of the packaging, it gives us an insight on how the producer is working, he, what we call his modus operandi. Likewise, we can analyze uh, the chemical structures and the chemical fingerprint of the products that we have seized, and we can see links between similar products or even sometimes uh, between products that are different but come from the same production line, from the same plant. So this will help us in visualizing trafficking networks. So these two tools together, they help us in um, producing inference rezoning to link product seizures, to highlight doping network distribution networks, and to identify the sources of supply. Another tool that is very informative, and it's more about organized doping, we can run retrospectively uh, what we call doping script analysis. The idea is to study this complex, the complex forms of doping uh, to design more efficient strategies. So we won't see the doping commission um, process as a single act, but rather as, like I said before, a modus operandi. So we will map the sequence of actions that take place before, during, and after uh, doping to identify what are the key stages and where are the weak spots. This will give us a fuller range of um, potential intervention points for uh, disturbing, disrupting, and even preventing doping commission. So the whole idea behind doping script analysis is to come up with uh, solutions to reduce the opportunities to commit doping and the resources to do it, to do, for doing it, sorry. And also to increase the risk associated with um, trying to to dope. So, and um, if we put things in perspective, using those tools and um, sharing information with all of you, actually, with all of the anti-doping partners, uh, you all have a piece of the puzzle that we need to share together. We need to establish a sort of platform for exchanging information. This will help us in um, refining the, um, the targeting of, uh, of our testing, and it has been pointed out today that we need to be cost efficient, we need to uh, favor quality over quantity, so this is very important. And also, it will help us in, of course, dismantling those big doping networks. We need also to um, gather broader uh, sources of information that comes from sociology, on substance use in society. We need to listen to the sports community. We have a lot of information coming from, uh, from teams. Uh, from the pharmaceutical industry on the release of new, um, new medications, etc. This helps us in assessing the size, seriousness, and evolution of any given phenomenon and to coordinate the actions for tailored strategies. Because as we said today, there is not just one solution for everything. There is, every situation has got particularities, whereas there it is, um, different countries have different prevalence, different sports, there is a difference between team sports, individual sports, etc. And like I said, we can run this retrospective script analysis to understand the mechanisms of organized doping and to act against it. So in conclusion, um, anti-doping intelligence is, in my opinion, a most promising avenue. It's, not, it's a difficult avenue, but it has proven very informative in, forensic, uh, in the forensic field, so we could use it. We need rather scientific innovation than um, technology innovation and be more exploratory, explorative to think outside of that judicial box. The benefits will be to gain real-time knowledge on what's going on really, um, so we can uh, take decisions that are intelligence-led 
in a more global and proactive way rather than case-based and reactive way. And eventually, we'll be able to design long-term problem-solving actions and to come up with innovative policies and prevention or reduction programs. I would like to thank my colleagues at the Swiss Laboratory for Doping Analysis, my colleagues at the School for Criminal Justice, FIFA for having us today, and of course, all of you for your attention.